Hi, this is Andy Teach, host of Andy's Awesome Adventures, and welcome to Florence, Italy. We're here in Florence, which is where the Renaissance began, and it ran from about 1300 to 1700, and in fact, Renaissance means rebirth. And what happened is Renaissance was basically an extension of the Middle Ages, and it was before the Age of Enlightenment. So during the Renaissance, there was a focus on humanism, where man was the center of all things. And as a result of that, there were great strides in things like science, art, architecture, politics, and literature. And one of the most famous people from Florence was Michelangelo, or as they say in Florence, Michelangelo. And he's still only known by one name, uh, just like Elvis, Madonna, and Prince. And Michelangelo is his first name. You know his full name. It is Michelangelo de Lodovico Buonarate Simone. So that's Michelangelo de Lodovico Buonarate Simone. That is his full name. I bet you didn't know that. So when you first arrive here and see this immense building and complex, this is the Florence Cathedral known as the Duomo. And two things you notice right away. One is how big it is. It is humongous. As you can see, uh, that's the cathedral. To the right is the, uh, the bell tower. There's a baptistry. Uh, there's a museum. And, it, it, and it's also uh, Brunelleschi's dome, the famous dome which we climbed up earlier today. Uh, another thing you will notice is just how intricate and detailed all of the work on the outside is. Uh, whether it be mosaics, uh, some of the stonework. It's just amazing what they did during the Renaissance in terms of creative creativity. How long did it take to build this complex? And it's about 150 years, 1296 to 1436. Anyway, uh, Florence is beautiful. If you're an art fan, architecture fan, this is the place to be. The Cathedral of Florence, officially known as Cattedrale Santa Maria del Fiore, but better known as the Duomo, was originally planned in 1296 as the Gothic Cathedral by Anafo di Cambio. It replaced the Church of Santa Riparata, a cathedral church with a history going back to the early Middle Ages, the remnants of which we will see later in the crypt. In the 13th century, many Italian cities were getting rich because of trade on the Silk Road. To demonstrate their wealth, many of these cities built large cathedrals. Most of this cathedral was built at the beginning of the Renaissance. By the end of the 15th century, the cathedral had a Renaissance dome sitting on top of a Tuscan Gothic structure with Gothic Renaissance side doors but still no facade. The Medici realized that Giotto's original plans for the facade were too Gothic to match the Renaissance style roof, so they opened up a new competition to design the facade. Because many different people were in charge of the project over the next century, the style continually changed. Francesco Talenti, who led the construction of the cathedral from 1351 on, increased its size even more by extending the nave. The central nave was built in 1378 and the aisles were built in 1380. Construction of the church would last until 1436 when it was consecrated by Pope Eugene IV. The originally planned Gothic front facade, however, was unrealized. It was originally designed by Arnolfo in Romanesque style and then in Gothic style by Talenti. The stunning marble cladding that we see today was only added much later, from 1876 to 1887, in a neo-Gothic style, with colorful patterns by Emilio de Fabrice. As a result, the facade nicely complements the cathedral's 14th century bell tower design. Let's take a closer look at the beautiful and intricate facade. Above the rose window, there are busts of great Florentine artists. Here we see the Twelve Apostles with the Madonna and Child in the middle. The three huge bronze doors date from 1899 to 1903. They were adorned with scenes from the life of the Madonna. The main portal or door was by Augusto Pasalia.
The mosaics and the lunettes above the doors were designed by Niccolo Barabino. They represent from left to right charity among the founders of Florentine philanthropic institutions, Christ enthroned with Mary and John the Baptist, and Mary surrounded by Florentine artisans, merchants, and humanists paying homage to the faith. This is the entrance to the dome or cupola. This is the Porta della Mandorla, or Door of the Almond, on the north side of the cathedral. <laughs> it's called that because of the almond-shaped oriel in which the Virgin ascends to heaven above the door. The mosaic of the Annunciation in the Lunette by David Gerlandio and his brother Domenico was made from 1489 to 1490 and shows the announcement by the angel Gabriel to Mary that she would give birth to a son. So this is the Giotto Bell Tower. It was designed by Giotto di Bandone. And it was originally designed in 1334. And at the time, he was the official master builder of the city. And he died in 1337. So the bell tower was completed first by Andrea Pisano and later by Francesco Talente. And it's over 250 feet tall. And it was finally completed in 1359. Beautiful bell tower. So the facade is made with green, pink, and white Tuscan marble. Beautiful marble. And what they call the relief decorations were created by Pisano. So it was a team effort that built this, but it's called Giotto's Bell Tower. And you can hear the bells ring, I believe, every hour. Actually, the bells are rung at various times, including at 11.30 a.m., the only ones in Florence that are rung at this time. Brunelleschi initiated the signal for the workers on the dome. It is said that if the quick-set mortar being mixed at ground level and raised to the construction zone was mixed just prior to the lunch break, the workers were returned from their break to find the concrete set and therefore wasted. The 11.30 a.m. bell told the workers to stop preparing the mortar. Let's take a closer look at the tower. Each of the four sides features a continuation of the other sides. Andrea Pisano and members of his school carried Giotto's design up to the first two levels, while artists such as Alberto Arnaldi adorn the outside with carved lozenges. The decorative hexagonal panels and lozenges display the concept of universal order and tell the story of the redemption of mankind. The reliefs begin with the creation of man inspired by Genesis on the lower level in the hexagonal panels and continue with the lozenges with their blue majolica background with a depiction of his activities, the planets which regulate the course of his existence, the virtues which fortify him, the liberal arts which educate him, and the sacraments which sanctify him. On the next level on each side there were four gothic statues and niches. They were sculpted in the 1300s and 1400s by different artists and represent various prophets and patriarchs including David, Solomon, Moses, and Abraham. Over time, these panels and sculptures have been substituted by copies, but the originals are on view in the museum, which we will see later in the video. The three top levels of the tower were built by Francesco Talenti, master of the works from 1348 to 1359. Each level is larger than the lower one, but the perspective was designed so that when seen from below, each level looks exactly equal in size. Instead of a spire, Talenti built a large terrace at the top. We went inside the tower, but decided not to climb up the 414 steps because we had just climbed up the 436 steps of the Brunelleschi Dome. However, by not climbing up to the top of Giotto's tower, we missed a fantastic close-up view of the dome. The Florence Cathedral Dome by Filippo Brunelleschi was built from 1420 to 1434 and was consecrated in 1436. It is 376 feet tall and the lantern on top of the dome, which was added in 1461 by Michelozzi Michelozzo, is 66 feet high. 
On top of the lantern rests the bronze ball built by Andrea del Verrocchio in 1472. To position the ball, they used machines invented by Brunelleschi. A young Leonardo da Vinci was among the apprentices that helped in this difficult operation. In other words, he was an unpaid intern. A part of the dome remained unfinished when Brunelleschi died, the upper part of the drum. The competition to build this section was won by the Italian woodcarver, sculptor, and architect Baccio Dognolo. Construction of the drum began, but according to tradition, Baccio decided at some point to seek the opinion of Michelangelo, who was in town at the time. Looking at the work, Michelangelo exclaimed, It looks like a cricket cage. Offended, Baccio left the drum unfinished, just as we see it today. Brunelleschi, a goldsmith by trade, won a public competition and submitted his plans after he went to Rome to study the Pantheon, which had featured the world's largest dome. He was forced to work with his rival, Lorenzo Ghiberti, a fellow goldsmith. The dome is a major engineering feat and was ahead of its time because no reinforcement was used. No scaffolding was utilized as the dome supported itself as it was built. A double frame or shell with hollow space in between was used and the stairs were placed between the two shells. The outer, much smaller shell supports the roof and protects the inner shell from the elements. Brunelleschi placed herringbone brickwork, little known before his time, into the texture of the cupola. Brunelleschi also invented a three-speed hoist with an intricate system of gears, pulleys, screws and drive shafts powered by a single yoke of oxen turning a wooden tiller and a 65-foot-tall crane with a series of counterweights and hand screws to move loads laterally once they've been raised to the right height. So this is known as the Baptistry, and it's one of Florence's oldest buildings. It actually is older than the cathedral, and it's constructed on top of Roman foundations, possibly as early as the 6th century, so it's pretty old. The octagon had been a common shape for baptisteries for many centuries since early Christian times. The number eight is a symbol of regeneration in Christianity, signifying the six days of creation, the day of rest, and a day of recreation through the sacrament of baptism. The inside dates to about the 13th century, and there's mosaics on the ceiling, uh, which depict stories from the Bible, and we're gonna take a look at that in a few minutes. The exterior is white and green marble, which is beautiful. Let's get a close-up of that. <laughs> so after the interior was done, uh, something called the Guild of the Wool Merchants, they funded a renovation. And originally it were wooden doors, but they replaced it with these new bronze doors back in the 14th century. And these doors are very famous. And we're gonna close up in a minute. It's called the Gates of Paradise. So the south doors were created in 1336 by Pisano, who also did part of the bell tower. And in 1403, a design by Lorenzo Ghiberti uh, was selected. They actually picked him in a contest over Brunelleschi for the design of the door. However, the panel submitted by Ghiberti's main rival Brunelleschi is now considered the first Renaissance artwork as it departed from the prevailing Byzantine art style by using perspective and showing realistic depictions of humans in their environment. Let's get a close up of the door. Alright, this is a better view. So each of these panels depicts a biblical scene. Now I'm going to get a little closer. There's 10 of them total. So all the panels were done by 1452. And these are not the original panels. They finally put in replicas. But the originals, I believe, are inside the cathedral somewhere. We'll do one by one. Here are the 10 panels in detail, starting in the upper left going down. The creation of Adam and Eve and original sin and the expulsion from the paradise of earth. The story of Noah with the ark, in the foreground his shame, drunkenness, and on the right his sacrifice. Isaac, on the roof is Rebecca hearing God's warning about the eventual conflict between her two unborn sons. Moses receiving the Ten Commandments. David in the process of severing the head of Goliath. 
now the upper right going down. Cain and Abel, the brothers offer their sacrifices, Cain slays Abel. Abraham, the angels announce that Sarah will have a son. Joseph, being sold by his brothers. The conquest of Jericho, Joshua on a chariot preceded by the Ark of the Covenant. Solomon, receiving the Queen of Sheba. While the exterior is definitely interesting to look at, especially due to the intricate bronze doors, its interior is really worth a visit, especially to see the mosaics on the inside of the cupola. Work began on the mosaic decoration of the interior in the 13th century and it took 60 to 70 years to complete. The mosaics were by Jacopo Toriti, possibly with the assistance of several members of the New Florentine School of Painting. The mosaics are dominated by the huge figure of Christ in judgment, with scenes from the Last Judgment occupying three of the dome's eight segments. On his left are images of salvation, which were meant to comfort good citizens, while on the right, damnation and hell, which was supposed to scare the crap out of them. The horizontal layers tell the stories of St. John the Baptist, the patron saint of Florence, of Jesus, of Joseph, and of the creation of the world. The angelic hosts occupy the highest point of all, in the center of the dome. These are the eastern panels from bottom to top. A partial view of the story of John, the life of Christ, presentation in the temple, Joseph's dream, and his flight into Egypt. The story of Joseph, his sale and his time in prison. The creation, the hardships of Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel's offerings, and Cain killing Abel, and the angels. These are the northwest panels from bottom to top. The damned in hell where the devil is eating newly arrived souls. John the Baptist and the apostles as witnesses to the last judgment. Angels with the instruments of torture and with trumpets, and choirs of angels. Besides the spectacular ceiling, there are some other highlights in the interior as well. I'm not sure, but I think in the movie Inferno with Tom Hanks, this is where the death mask of Dante was hidden. The tomb of anti-pope Giovanni XXIII, born Baldassare Cosa, can be found in the Florence Baptistry. He was called the anti-pope because he opposed Pope Gregory XII, whom the Catholic Church now recognizes as the rightful successor to St. Peter. He was eventually deposed and tried for various crimes. Cosa died in Florence in 1419, and although he was not well liked in his time, he was a friend of the powerful Medici family who had him buried in this holy building. It was thanks to Cosa that the Medici managed to become so wealthy. Upon becoming pope, Cosa, out of loyalty to Giovanni de' Medici, who had helped him on many occasions, took on the Medici Bank to manage the Vatican's finances, which played a large part in helping them amass a fortune. Although he was stripped of his popehood, Cosa wanted to be buried in the Florence Baptistry. Cosimo de' Medici commissioned this funeral monument from Donatello and Michelozzo between 1422 and 1428 for his notorious friend. Intarso is a type of inlaid marble work where different colored pieces of stone are joined together so closely that the finished product seems like one singular piece. Intarso can be done to form images or simply geometric or floral patterns.
Based on the intricate exterior, I was expecting a cathedral filled with numerous paintings, mosaics, and sculptures like St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, but actually, the cathedral's gothic interior is less colorful and decorations were kept to a minimum. The exception is the fresco in the dome's interior, painted between 1572 and 1579 by Giorgio Vasari and his assistants. The fresco depicts scenes from The Last Judgment. The restoration of these ceiling frescoes began in 1978 and was completed in 1994. Also of note is the marble floor with intricate patterns, which is attributed to Baccio Daniello, who also worked on the drum of the dome. After his death, one of his sons continued his work. The clock is the work of Lorenzo di Benvenuto della Vopaia and his heads of prophets, or perhaps the four evangelists in the corners, painted by Paolo Uccello in 1443, who also painted the blue background and the gold hands. Time has its point of reference on the clock as the sunset, the time when Ave Maria is sung. The clock is wound every eight or nine days. The windows are from cartoons by famous artists of the early Renaissance period, Ghiberti, Paolo Uccello, Donatello, and Andrea del Castano. The Museo dell'Opera del Duomo, or Museum of the Works of the Cathedral, opened in 1891. The museum has over 750 works covering 720 years of history, with 25 rooms on three floors. This is the Saloni del Paradiso, Hall of Paradise, which contains original Duomo facade sculptures on a reconstructed facade. It also features the original baptistry doors, including the Gates of Paradise. Thank you. 
The Galleria del Campanile, or Room of Giotto's Bell Tower, features original reliefs and statues from the famous bell tower. Here we see 16 original statues and 54 reliefs, which are shown in their original order. The Sala del Cantori, a room of the choirs, features two choir lofts from the Duomo from the 1430s. The deposition, Michelangelo's Pieta, was intended for his own tomb. It is an unfinished work which he made from 1546 to 1555 and it once stood in the Duomo. The hooded figure of Nicodemus is also interpreted as a self-portrait. Michelangelo abandoned it because of the flaws in the marble. The damage to Christ's left leg and arm is believed to have been inflicted by Michelangelo himself in frustration at his failing skills. The Galleria della Coppola focuses on Brunelleschi's dome. I see dead people. The Galleria dei Modelli features seven wooden models submitted for the new facade, which was going to replace the medieval facade that was demolished in 1587. Here is one of the models. Here are some of the other highlights of the museum. There is a secret that lies a few feet beneath the Duomo, the Santa Reparata Crypt, where a major archaeological dig beneath the cathedral from 1965 to 1973 brought to light the remains of the old basilica of Santa Reparata, strong evidence of early Christianity in Florence. The first building dates back to about 780 AD, and the mosaics date back to the 8th century. The second transformation occurred during the late 9th century, while the third and final transformation occurred in the 13th century. Subsequent maintenance kept Santa Reparata going until 1379, when a decision was reached to demolish the basilica completely in order to make way for the new cathedral. The basilica's foundation is said to be the result of a vow and thanks for the Christian victory over the king of the Goths around 405 AD.
Here are the remains of Santa Reparata. Saint Reparata was a third century virgin martyr. She was arrested for her faith and was tortured. Her persecutors tried to burn her alive, but she was saved by a shower of rain. She was then compelled to drink boiling tar. When she again refused to renounce her beliefs, she was decapitated. Her legend states that immediately upon dying, a dove appeared to symbolize the departure of her spirit to heaven. Later elaborations of her legend state that her body was laid in a boat and blown by the breath of angels to a bay in Nice. Well, that's the end of the tour. There's a lot to see, but I highly recommend spending a day here, seeing the great architecture, and learning and experiencing the history behind this amazing complex.